So Tim Sheens, welcome to the In Touch podcast. As we've just touched on off air, a lot of people know you now as the coach, but just take us back to the start of your playing career with, with the Penrith Panthers. Oh, well, we're going back a long time there, Robbie. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I started with Penrith 1970. I was graded and uh, finished in 82. So I had 13 years there with eight first grade coaches in 13 years. So um, pretty tough years. Well, it wasn't long after they went in. They, they ended the, the, the comp in 67. So it was only three years after the club. That, uh, Penrith and Cronulla both went in together to make it a 12-team comp. And um, being an outer city team, no freeways, you know, it was you had to live out there, and a lot of the players in Sydney, you know, just wouldn't go out there, you know. So, but we had a, a decent junior area, uh, which they still have, even more so these days. And uh, and I was a junior. A lot of the guys I played with that were graded that year were juniors. So, um, but we were young, and of course, you know, it was always difficult. You had to travel into Sydney to the games. You had to drive yourself in on a Sunday, uh, find parking. And then, you know, it was, you know, it was uh, a lot tougher than the guys who got it these days. Get into the game and then go to work again the next day, you know, so, um, and do all the travelling as well. So we won a few home games because of the reverse of that. The teams happened to come out to Penrith. You know, we, uh, we were always, uh, we were always a decent home team, but away team, we really struggled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it didn't quite have the glitz and the glamour then that the NRL does now? No, that's for sure. I, I've been lucky enough to live through it. You know, I've um, from semi-professional, you know, working and playing uh, to full-time, which was started in 97 with Super League uh, and News Limited uh, you know, taking over. And then, you know, a year or so later, we combined to the NRL after the ARL and uh, Super League came together. And you guys over here are obviously... Uh, in New Zealand came into Super League at the same time. So, you know, it's it's continued to grow. And, of course, the players now uh, are lucky enough to be able to, um, you know, play play the game they love and get paid to do it, not have to work. It's, uh, it's a blessing. I wouldn't have mind. Although I've been lucky too in that as a coach, I've done the same thing. I've never gone back to real work, if um, you want to call it that. Um, but it's something that I've loved to do. And so, you know, they say you don't work a day in your life if you're doing something you love. So I'm, I've been pretty lucky. Tim, you know, uh, like Robbie said, incredible. Not, not a lot of people didn't know you had had a long career player as a player as well. Mm. The 250-odd games there at Penrith, is that still club record for a player? No, no, no. I think... Um, uh, Royce and a couple of the boys, Royce Simmons, and a few of them went past. I had about 100, 166, to, and there's a bit of a dispute because the records weren't all that good from those days. About 166 to about 175 games um, in first grade. Uh, I was the first junior to get the 100 first grade games. Um, but uh, Royce, Royce and a few of the other boys have blown me away since, of course. But... Um, and rightly so, you know, Royce, Royce Simmons is one of the best uh, best players that club ever had yeah, in yeah. lots of ways, in lots of ways, not just as a player, but as a as a guy and as a captain and as a coach later on. And he's still there. He's still working for them, so um, which is good to see. But, uh, yeah, it was um, a lot of games. A lot of In those days, of course, mate, you didn't play first grade as an 18 year old because of scrums, and I was a forward. Well, I was a schoolboy back. I played 5'8 and centre. But not quick, not um, not quick enough for grade, so they stuck me in the second row, and then eventually one of the coaches, Bobby Boland, stuck me in the front row and taught me how to scrimmage because you had to know how to scrimmage. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Penrith were unlucky there. John Farragher, you know, was injured in a scrum and was in a wheelchair, and he was only a young back rower who really was stuck up a uh, stuck up into the front row. That and that day I wasn't playing; I was injured. And uh, playing in Newtown, he got hurt in a scrum. So the scrums were pretty savage in those days. You know, you come together. I mean, rugby has changed it too, haven't they, where they've got to bend and, and, and bind and then, and then basically push. Well, Australian, the rugby league scrums came from, you know, you'd be a metre and a half apart and then you'd just go looking for your take the head and butt, you know. So um, I suppose I've got the right size head for that sort of thing, Holly. So, <laughs> but... Um, I've got uh, numerous scars and uh, eye, eye stitches in particular around head scars from scrummaging. And, uh, 
you know, you'd be 24, 25 scrums a game and then they'd reset it and collapse and you weren't allowed to let your hook over. I, I hooked, I propped for Mike Stevenson and he said, don't ever let me fall on the ground, you know, because they just trample you if you're down. So, um, so learning that, so I was, I think I was about 22, I think, before I really started to play first grade. Yeah, you had to do your apprenticeship basically and it was open age third grade then and you played against and with a lot of old guys coming back through the system and then you played reserve grade and then then first grade yeah so you had to you had to actually learn how to scrimmage so what so oh, what, yeah, do you yeah. th- what do you think of the the scrums today then com- back, compared back to then well in many ways mate I, I don't mind it's a non-contested scrum like rugby if they're not got props on or for instance i'll have a non-contested scrum yeah and i laugh at rugby who say Oh, it's not a scrum. Well, rugby, I've never, I've hardly ever seen in rugby a feed against the head. They do feed still behind the hooker, but you might get pushed off the ball, but you don't, I don't see too many uh, hookers winning the ball against the feed. What it is in, in league, and, it, you know, um, I'm not one of those who's stuck in the old days, Wally, you know that. Yeah. The, the game, the game I, I came through initially the unlimited tackle, then the four tackle, then the six tackle. And as soon as you got to four and six tackle, you didn't need a scrum. You didn't need to be able to rake the ball at the ruck um, because there was turnovers every six tackles. The only reason you needed – it's like rugby. It's unlimited. But so you need – you win a scrum, but you're more likely to win a line out or maybe win a, a maul on the ground. Um, otherwise, you haven't got the ball. So it is uh, – was un, it was a rule that didn't need to be in, you know, contested scrums, to be quite honest. So, but it is a good idea to have all the six forwards in the scrum at the same time, particularly now when you can move the scrum around and you can have midfield scrums and you can have them on the 20 or on the 10, you put the scrum wherever you like. And that puts the forwards in and it gives the backs one-on-one for at least the first tackle. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in that. What got Tim, just talk us through the unlimited tackles then. How did that used to work? Well, you'd, you'd think that, so you, if you said to the guys today, you got the ball for the, the whole game if you don't drop it, um, you know, they'd be laughing thinking they wouldn't. But, but you know, the skill levels of the players in those days, those big old leather balls that were slippery and slimy, the fields that were always muddy, you know, always muddy, yeah. uh, nothing like today. The conditions had a lot to do with the drop ball. You'd be surprised how often the ball would be dropped. But you would think... You, you wouldn't, like in those days too, you'd, you'd kick a ball and the fullback would kick it straight back on the first and then the fullback, their fullback, would kick it back again. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you had the kicking duels. <laughs> well, those sorts of things, you'd say, how stupid is that, you know, to do that? <laughs> kick it away on the first. But, but, but then when you played the ball, you nearly got your hands kicked off, you know, with the, the mark of being allowed to ruck at the ball and kick at the ball. So, um, yeah, and the, the, as I say, the balls were all over the place. The shape of the ball wasn't consistent like it is today. Um, and uh, and they trained, most teams trained on their main oval, right? And the third grade did too and the second grade. So there was no grass, you know, um, except for the wingers down the sideline. They had a bit of grass, but not in the middle. So any sort of conditions, they were terrible conditions, and that forced a lot of error. You'd be surprised. So um, – uh, and the players were part-time. You train initially – in Sydney, I remember training Tuesday, Thursday, right, and, and play Sunday. It was always – and the mat, match of the day would be Saturday. Then they actually put in a third day's training. Well, all the players blew up about it, didn't they? Because they're working. <laughs> As it was, you had to get – you know, Saturday morning training meant you had to get time off work because a lot of the guys worked on Saturday. Yeah. So, um, so, so really they're only training twice a week and you'd have almost six months off, you know, and um, – so, you know, your conditioning was, was basically run, 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 running hills, running roads, um, not skill-based. In fact, a lot of coaches, I remember saying, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll touch, keep them hungry for the ball, we'll give it to them in January. So all pre-season, pre-Christmas, you wouldn't touch a ball, you know. Like, it was just so, um, so old-fashioned when you consider from today, you know. But that's why I'm saying the boys today are blessed to be able to have the conditions they've got, the fields, the, the, the rules are great. Yeah, I mean, I always disagree with some, but at the end of the day, mate, uh, compared to the old days, yeah, it's uh, it's chalk and cheese, and the game's got better and better. The athletes have got better and better, um, and the game surviving isn't surviving pretty well. Tim, but at what point in your playing career were you starting to look towards coaching, and and what was it that attracted you about that 
to that specific area? Well, interesting. Uh, 1982 was my last year there, um, and I was captain of the side for 81 and 82. Um, John Peard was the coach. Anyway, Charlie Gibson, um, rest his soul, he was the CEO, and I walked into his office at the end of 82 and uh, about re-signing, and I'd hurt the medial ligament and didn't finish the back end of the season. And he said, uh, don't bother sitting down. Um, we haven't got any money for you. That's That was how he said it to me. So with a few expletives from me, I walked out the door. Anyway, um, I got a phone call from Campbelltown area, which was group six, you know, in the country areas over there, they play in their groups to whether or not I'd have a, a game and I'd, they'd want me to captain. And and uh, so I went over there and a guy called Ray Corkery was the coach who'd played hooker for St George in the old days and things. And so I... Um, I led the side and he used to play around what I wanted to do. He, he'd talk to me about, you know, we'll do this and do that. And, and we had good discussions. So I got a sort of a taste for, you know, thinking about which way the game should play and what we should do. So we won the group six and in the Southern division, we won that too. And I made country, um, captain country seconds, went to New Zealand to uh, Hawley down to, um, uh, on a tour with country first, um, at the end of 83 in, um, down in Christchurch. Yeah. Um, and then uh, 84, I looked like going to Queensland to continue to play just at a lower level. Um, and my wife had family up there, so we were going there. And then I, I got called to Penrith Leagues Club. They were having a, um, a, a crisis meeting about, you know, they looked like they could get kicked out of, out of the league because they were always struggling for money and the Leagues Club was always having to prop them up they were buying players that were failing, you know, they were duds, they weren't working out. There's, I won't go through the list, but there was quite a list. Anyway, um, and I remember it was my son's birth, my youngest son's birthday, so I had to leave. It was in, this, it was in November 21st anyway. Um, then the next day, Roger Cowan, the CEO, rang me and said, listen, would you like to coach the team? And that came out of the <coughs> room, you know. Uh, so I hadn't really planned it, um, although I was offered captain coach in Queensland, so I sort of, maybe thinking it, but I never really give it a lot of thought about coaching. Anyway, I had a real estate business and um, I uh, said to my partners, look, I'm, this is, I've got to have a go at this because he made me full time. It was, I was full time and he based me on the English uh, soccer system or football system. Sorry, that's a dirty word to say, soccer. Um, that is, I was going to do all the recruitment. I was going to manage, I was going to basically going to be the manager of the, of the team and, and the club. So I was full-time and part-time, so I took a, a leave of absence from my business and said to the guys, I'll see you in 12 months because Penrith, were, remember, when they had the meeting, they were Penrith, the league looked like they're going to throw them out. Anyway, uh, the licence club came to the rescue and saved them. But, uh, so Roger said, look, Tim, if you win two games, we'll be happy. And um, I was lucky enough that we won a few more than two, uh, picked up Greg Alexander and Mark Geyer and, Mark Carroll and so many good young players and added to, we only had six on contract in the team when I took them over in November, late November too, so we're almost Christmas. And um, the end of the year, I ended up winning coach of the year um, and uh, we missed the semis, which was top five by one win. We had to beat Parramatta in the last game. I think we had 21,000 people in the ground. I don't think they've ever had that many at, to that date. And Parramatta beat us. Um, you know, they were a pretty fair side in the early 80s, obviously, under Jack Gibson. And um, and so um, Roger gave me some more money, <laughs> which, which was nice. And um, and here I am still coaching or being involved in the sport anyway, um, you know, more than 40 years, just about 40 years later, really. Nearly 40 years, I suppose. Yeah. So, Tim, you were with Penrith there for 13 how years. Long? How many? 13, oh, 13 years as a player. Yeah. Uh, and four years as a coach. And then you moved on to, I remember in these days, I think when I was at Newcastle, we might have played you, you moved on to the uh, Canberra right. Raiders and really yeah. they, they were a real force back then, weren't they, in the in the 80s? Well, they were, they were and they weren't. It was funny. Um, I agreed in, in um, 87, early 87, because I told Roger Cowan that I wouldn't be coaching at the end of my four-year deal because I wasn't going anywhere. You know, they didn't have any money. We were, we couldn't buy any players. We were, you know, as a side note, I signed all the players. Greg Alexander signed for match payments only, match payments only. Mm -hmm. um, 
and so did all, uh, virtually every player bar the six that were on contract signed for match payments only because we had no money for sign-ons because they just moved into their new premises, the new club that they got there now. They moved in there in 84, halfway through 84. So, um, you know, Roger said, look, in five or six years, we'll have the money to buy Wally Lewis and put him on the bench if we want to. Uh, and to his, to his credit, they were right, but I'd already moved on to Canberra. We played Canberra in, in the early 87 in a trial, and I thought I had a pretty good side. And they beat us easy, you know, and uh, I was impressed. I thought, geez, they've, they've really gone well. And Wayne Bennett was co- co-coaching with Don Ferner. Anyway, um, where, I, where I got a bit lucky was um, the uh, Broncos were due to come in in 88 and they wanted Wayne. So they approached Canberra. They paid Canberra a fee, I understand, and Bennett left. So they were looking for a coach and that Don was retiring. And uh, because I'd done pretty well, I won a couple of awards and, I got penned to the semis, their first semis ever in 85. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I met um, uh, the club at, uh, for a lunch and um, signed the deal halfway through the year with John McIntyre, and uh, who still remains a, a good friend of mine since then. And, um, and then they made the grand final, didn't they, in 87. Uh, no one expected that. They got beat, but I took them on then in 88. And uh, we didn't. We, we were eliminated by Balmain and Ellery Hanley in uh, '88, and I lost Mal with a broken arm again, so he didn't play in that game, those games. And then '89, obviously, that's where we got better again, and, uh, won the premiership, and then went and then kicked on from there. Yeah, I remember that uh, that Canberra team. Um, you just come over then, didn't you? And you played uh, Woodness in the World Club Challenge. That yes, Woodness had Coloto. Mossy, Coloto and Sorensen and yep, yep. Jonathan Davies and all them boys. One, it was a pack. Yeah, a fire, a, fire, a fire on the wing. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. They, they were the champions. They were the English champions, so there were no mugs. But also in those days, I mean, that's <laughs> a quick story. At the end of end of 89, we win a premiership, right? And then we're told we've got to go, we've got to get on a plane. I couldn't find the players for a week. We didn't have a training <laughs> session. We had no mobiles, right? Can you imagine? Yeah. They were, they were drunk for a week. And I'm not going to offer an excuse. We, our witness were too good. But then we had – and it was no business class air flight story. Yeah. I f- eventually found them all and got them on the plane. Uh, and they wanted to drink on the plane as well. They were, they were, and, and I try, I stopped them from doing that. I had to tell the hosties, don't give them any alcohol. <laughs> and we got – we basically flew to England and the, uh, got there at the start of the week and the end of the week we played. So we, we led early. You know, I, I still remember my assistant coach saying to me, um, we're in a bit of trouble. And I said, why? He's, we're leading. And he said, well, Bradley Clyde's walking. Um, and he was. He was absolutely exhausted. And now Bradley Clyde ran the whole 80 minutes of every game I've ever seen him play, you know. So then Witness went past us and beat us. Yeah. Um, I think we got to about 12 nil lead or something. And we got, we've got to try pull back, which would have taken us about 18 um, a forward pass, the English touch judge, you know, they you know, uh, dudded us. Um, but no, they, they were too good for us. And uh, in my little stint at Witness, they they reminded me many days that they, all the photos they've got of that game down the corridors of Wood- over there at Witness Stadium. Yeah, they were they were unbelievable scenes. And, you know, that's, that's probably why, you know, Witness went on to do good things as well. They were a great club, weren't they, uh, back then? And yeah, that's what we miss now. Like you know, the crowds and everything. And I, I mm. still remember that game. You know, it was a night game, wasn't it? Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. Top top game, but everyone obviously knew that Canberra was uh, in a bit of party mode. And oh well, yes, but you know that's no excuse. I mean, the it was one of the I don't know if it was the first series or one of the first in the, in a handful of the first series. I don't know when it actually started. Didn't didn't Manly play Wigan? The year before, 87, I think. Which was the first one, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So it was still still treated a little bit lightly by the Australian sides, if you know what I mean. Uh, It was a big thing for England. I mean, the advantage was you had to come to England to play. It was straight after a grand final, which is obviously full of celebration. And then for a while there, then they started it in January, didn't they, because of that. And then you travelled, you know, you took your players. You didn't have time to recover from injuries. You had to pick a squad based on hopefully they're all okay. 
and uh, you weren't allowed to play another trial these days. These days, they tend to um, prepare better. Yeah. But in saying that, you know, I'm not going to whinge about it. it. It was, it was, didn't have the prestige that it has now either. Or, although it's lost a bit of that, I think. I think there for a while it was really good. Um, you know, the first ten years of it probably, and then it sort of fell away a bit. I think. Um, um, I, you know, it's still a decent game to play to see, but I don't think it's got the well, you know, the world's best club side. You know, it's not pushed as much as I would have thought it should be. Mm. And that's always arguable anyway, mate. It's a, a game's a game, isn't it? You know, you can, you can be the best side in the world and get beat on any given day. Yeah, yeah. No, that, back then, though, they were real – they were really events. They were top-class oh, events. Yeah. Everyone yeah, used yeah. to really look forward to it. And, every, yeah. you know, m- yeah. most people from all the clubs used to attend. And, it, yeah. you know, it would be good to, to try and get that – uh, yeah, well, a lot, a lot of it, a lot of it, Hawley was because you didn't often see the Australians over as a club. You yeah. saw them as a rep side every four years, but also you didn't see it on TV either. You know, because um, uh, pay TV wasn't really up and running, and so you might have saw the match of the day from Australia, but you didn't see a lot of Australian footy, and certainly Australia didn't see much of England. So it was a bit of a novelty, I think, when the Australian club side turned up and the two grand final sides played. So it had a lot of oomph in its um, promotion for that reason alone. Um, and Australia was sort of uh, kicking up, you know, as through the 80s and so on, the Australians started to, you know, it was always, when I, I remember when I was playing, England was was the big brother, you know, like English Rugby League ran the game. I mean, the the six tackle and that came in, four tackle came in from England, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't put together by Australians now. Yeah, so you know, I I was amazed at you know what the decisions are making in England, and everyone wanted an English player to play in Australia. You know, Tommy Bishops and all the guys came over at times. That's why Steve O was over there, and Billy Ashes with Penrith, Malcolm Reilly, and so we all thought everything that England were doing were, were, was the way to go. You know, their skills in particular, and then it just switched after Australia. Obviously, became very dominant in respect to the Test matches, and then. Um, and then with the Super League coming in and the money coming in, of course, Australia have just boomed, you know. And uh, now Australia uh, decide to wear their shorts backwards, then England have to wear their shorts backwards, if you know what I mean. It, it just seems to be um, the game's being run by the NRL, which I'm not a fan of particularly. Uh, I think uh, I don't think England should stick its head in the fire just because Australia does sometimes. Because uh, I, I can't say that everything Australia have done in the last 10 years by rules and that would are the best, to be quite honest. But um, I, sit, I sit in them. I sit in a lot of them meetings, Tim, and mm. I, I have to totally agree with you. Then with, yeah. with what you're saying there, because yeah, well, yeah, I they, think you know uh, a heap of them uh, suit the Australian system or whatever, and you get people running the game over there who think it's all about entertainment, and it is. It's an entertainment, but it's still a sport, and it's still. Uh, uh, got to be handled that way, not just for the crowd, you know. I'm not a fan of uh, um, Golden Point, for instance, never have been, but um, uh, voted against it when they tried to bring it in here, but of course the clubs decided they'd go that way. But I, I think a draw, if you're playing Wigan at Wigan and after 80 minutes you're 18 all, you don't want to give Wigan another 10 minutes to beat you. And I made that point when I was in Australia about the Broncos. You, you know, away wins are, away draws are, are considered a good point, aren't they, from the point of view if you're in football? Um, so I thought, but, you know, everyone now says, oh, no, you know, it's exciting. Yeah, exciting. It's one out football and kicks the field goal. Yeah, real exciting. I don't, um, I don't see the benefit of it, to be quite honest. And besides, you go through on even points. Uh, two, four, six, eight, ten. You know, rather than have a seven or a nine, you know, which can obviously squeeze you into the semis at the back end of the year too. You know, I said exactly um, the same to him in the in the meeting, yeah. and I was, and you know, what, what I got thrown back at me. So you want to reward losing? Well, I said you haven't lost; you've drawn. So if you exactly. go for for <laughs> for a wakey or a Castleford to go to St Helens or a Wigan on a Wednesday or Thursday night, and they get mm. a draw, that's massive for them. But yes, then to, to then go there and give all that effort and draw and then yeah. pay extra time and come back with nothing. Exactly it, right. It doesn't seem right. So that, that what you've you just could said be the best team. Said. You, 
Yeah, exactly. Well, you can be the best team. The other team snatches a, a draw at half time and then flukes a uh, wins the toss, runs first, so they run they receive. Um, and if you win the toss in five minutes, you generally get three sets. If you receive and they get two, it's a five set five sets for five minutes. Yeah. And in that first uh, set, someone kicks a field goal, a la the, you know, uh, Gaz O'Brien in the uh, million power game from yeah. 45 out from an angle and and jags it, uh, you get beat. You could have been the better side, basically, you know, in, in for most of the game. So, no, I, I, you know, having played the game, coached the game, as you have, you know, I think it's a fair call if you finish 80 minutes in professional sport, particularly these days, You've exhausted yourself, and you get a point. You take a point. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with that. Because if look, if really Golden Point was attractive, I don't think it's attractive. You might be there holding your breath watching their field goals, but it's not attractive football, please. And the referees find it difficult to to blow a whistle unless you deliberately hit someone in the face, you know, in the head. Basically, they won't give a penalty for offside, you know, charging out a marker before the ball's even played to get to the guy kicking the field goal. But generally, they put the whistle away to a degree, uh, and it's only a real foul. If you foul someone, that's the only way you really get a penalty in those games most yeah. of the time. You yeah, know? And yeah. So I don't, see it, I don't see it being played even like the first 80 minutes for me. So, yeah. Tim. Yeah, anyway. Tim, all the accolades you received in, in Club Rugby League, you know, the, the four premierships, three times Dally M Coach of the Year, the first Australian coach to reach 600 games as well. How then does it come about to receive what I imagine would have been the dream job for a coach, becoming the, the head coach of the Australian national team? Uh, look, um, I was really, really excited about it when it was offered. Not under the circumstances, a bit disappointing because Ricky... Ricky um, uh, Stuart lost it, uh, lost the job um, for um, being Ricky, um, you know, being uh, fired up uh, over the situation. But Rick was really good, uh, you know, um, and and tipped me to so many things before I, I got the job. And I rang him actually to say, mate, look, I'm, you know, it's, it's disappointing, but you understand I couldn't knock it back. And he, he was all for it, you know. But for me, I, I, was, I wasn't... Um, I wasn't ever I – I never played for Australia. So – and I, I don't know whether I could have or couldn't have, depending on what team you played in, but I didn't. So – but I um, – so to, to actually manage the side, uh, coach the side, was uh, a huge, huge honour for me. And um, and I'll never forget those years, you know, the World Cup in 13 and losing a couple of big games to the Kiwis. They had a very good side. Mm-hmm. Um, taking it back off them. Um, you know, all those sort of things was a real contest. Even uh, playing, like, on the two the two four nations we played in in England, we actually played England in nine and eleven. Um, the England beat the Kiwis to play us in the finals. And Darren Lockyer's last game was eleven uh, to yeah. Dazzle. All those sort of milestones and things were were something that um, that I really. Uh, look back on and enjoy tremendously those moments. I mean, travelling the world with a, a team, the 13, the World Cup team, 2013, had 24 players, all had played state of origin that year. Uh, the only problem I had was trying to keep them happy when you pick 13 and the four that didn't pick weren't happy to a degree. But uh, you can consider that the, the, the next seven who didn't get a game at all uh, – but played for the States, you know what I'm saying? It's like two Australian sides play one another when that happens. And uh, so the quality of the group was just brilliant. So, How did you go about keeping everybody happy then to, to keep? Happy? Well, you rotate, you rotate the game. Some, some, in any team, some players get picked no matter what, you know, and there's an established gr- uh, core of most teams. And if you've got, you know, your, your team's not a great team if you've only got four or five of those. But if you've got 13 or 14 players that pick themselves every week in club land, I'm talking about, you've got a very good team. And, you know, if you look at some of the teams, you know, they could play, some of the guys could play poorly for a month and still get picked. In, in the Australian side, it was a bit the same. There was an established group, the halves, you know, like uh, Thurston and Lockyer when I first took over. Um, you know, you took a third halfback, I took Cronk, um, and he didn't get much football. But I tried to give them all one game. And I don't think I failed to do that. Everyone got at least one. Some got a bit more. 
Um, but really, you had to win the games. You know, you couldn't risk not. So there were some games you could play everyone, but and you could rotate your bench a little bit. But again, you know, if a team won a test, like generally you started with either England at, at you know open the the series with England or the Kiwis. Australia did. You had obviously the. I think we opened the series every year um, just because, whether it's four nations or whatever, because it was obviously to draw the people to the, to the game. So if you, be, you had to win that game, otherwise you found yourself, um, you know, in four nations, for instance, you lost again to the next side. Like if England beat you and then you got beat by New Zealand, you're out. Mm. So, you know, and that happened to us in, um, in nine. Um, and we had to beat – we had, no, we had a draw against the Kiwis. I think that's right in the first one, and then we had to beat um, it beat England at Wigan um, to make sure that we got to the final. Yeah, mm. and we managed to do that. But um, and that was that was the day the t- the sides that had um, uh, yeah. I think the the halves were Tompkins at halfback and um, what's the boy's name? He played at St Helens. He just made a comeback and then he's left the game again out of Leeds. Um, oh, the boy went to Rugby Union. Yes. Um, Dale Eastman. Yeah. Yeah, Eastman. Eastman, yeah. They were the halves. And a young Sam Burgess was playing for them in that as well. So, you know, they were um, they had a really good side. And uh, we had to work really hard to beat them. You know, so they're always – England were always good on home soil. Um, struggled in Australia – uh, in the Four Nations things, but they're always good. And I thought England had beaten New Zealand in the in the uh, World Cup to make the final. I was out watching it while we were warming up, while we were getting ready for our game, watching the last few minutes. And I went back in with about five minutes to go. And then Johnson mm. beat beat England with that uh, try. But um, otherwise, we, I thought we were going to play um, we were going to play England. Actually, I came back in and told Roy Simmons, uh, sorry, Dave Fernan, my assistant. Um, Looks like we're playing England, and then the whole game turned around on that one uh, that one moment. Yeah, beautiful, wasn't it? Loved it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you're a you're, you're a Kiwi, but you're on my side in that regard. <laughs> yeah. Hey Tim, you know the World Cup. So in the World Cup, um, thirteen when you won it. Yeah. On um, you know the pool games, just mm. just. I think it's interesting, you know, and everyone gets intrigued. And when you've got such a great side, obviously, how do you manage, how do coaching staff in the background decide, how, you know, the pool games? And then when you get to the final, we'll, we'll talk about the final after. But, mm. you know, you've said you've got to pick that team, strong team, if you open up against England or New Zealand. But then the yeah. pool games, you know, do you, do you ever think to rest your, your main boys or do you, you like to play your core? Yeah, I think you still play. You might play your third halfback, and you might play your second hooker. Um, but the players like like when 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 they're test matches, um, uh, they like to they like to make sure. Like Cameron Smith and guys like that wanted to play every game. You know, get Paul Gallon, and some wanted to. They were the two captains. One was obviously captain in Queensland, and Paul was captain in New South Wales. So I rarely left them out. Um, I think Cameron, I left out in, against France um, back in 09, and I think he still reminds me about it, you know. So he, he – um, but you try to play – you know, you, I address the players and say, look, I'm going to do the best I can to get everyone as much footy as I can. If it's one game or four or five, we don't know with injury and, and what's going to happen, but I'll do my best. But that's all I can promise. You know, I didn't promise everyone, you know, that they could play half the games – but you still need – you pick your best side to start um, and then around that you might keep four, half of the, half that team in there and change your bench um, as well. And then uh, the bench could come on and play, you know, uh, say, say your bench for game one moves into the team and you bring in a fresh bench and you rest four players. That's another way of doing it. Just to, And, I mean, I had quality players, not as if uh, – had any problems? You had to manage injuries because we lost Billy Slater with a shoulder injury in '09, mm. um, or was it '11? Trying to tackle Hall over the sideline in London, um, and uh, had to adjust the team to play. You know, with fullback, mind you, I had, I had fullbacks playing in the team like Travoyevich does now. I had Hayne and um, Darius Boyd playing, you know, in the in the centres and the, and on the wing. 
So then you um, you just manage it by you know, trying to um, trying to manage that that system, giving him a little bit of footy, and then you then you're looking for form, you know, because you know if someone's out of form or you get an injury, you've got to have some games. You can't not play the guys, and yeah. then after four weeks, oh hell, you know I've got an injury. So like someone like Billy, and we nearly lost Billy, obviously for the uh, for the um, World Cup as well when he injured his knee uh, against the Americans, I think it was. And uh, they didn't think he'd play, yeah, but he did, and obviously played well. But um, but in the meantime, I think we used uh, Darius back there because I had GI as well at times. Played him at fullback, yeah, or centre. Darius on the wing, and of course, one of the big controversial ones was I, I put Jared Hayne into uh, Brent Tate played against England the first game, and then I put Dar- uh, then, and I think he did the second game against Ireland, and then uh, Hayne came into the side. Um, and I put him in the centres, and he, he and uh, Brett Morris became the go-to side, as opposed to GI and uh, and uh, Darius Boyd. You'd think it would go to them, but it ended yeah. up going to Hayne. We end up Hayne and uh, and Brett Morris dominated the the last few games, including the final. So the final, then let's uh, how how what do you do? You know the. the just the build up to the final. How do you? Uh, yeah. How do you? Tackle we that? talked about it. Yeah, we talked about like we got uh, England scored against us very early in the first game, right? And uh, well, after that game, we made a pact with each other that we weren't going to let sides score against us, right? We were going through. Obviously, then we we're going to go through the uh, until we met England. We were going to go through. Uh, sorry, uh, New Zealand. We were going to go through um, uh, the the. Uh, the pool sides, right? So we we needed to improve our D. So the second game, no one scored against us, as in tries. Third game, it happened, and all of a sudden, it become a thing, you know. Right? Oh, then no one's going to score against us, right? Um, and we ended up doing it, right? And then by doing that, obviously, you win the game, you know. So most, if they can't score against you, I mean, they're not going to kick ten goals because we had twenty plus points in us as a side every game. Mm. Um, so, um, but New Zealand were a gun side, obviously, with Sonny Bill Williams, and, and they'd beaten England um, to get into the final. So there were, there were no mugs, and it was actually they were world, class, they were world champions. They'd been world champions since 08, because it was a five year break between 08 and the next World Cup for us in 13. Um, but the other thing that, that we talked about was, you know, just focusing on, on the mark. Um, not worrying about the end of the game, just worrying about the moment, just worry about your job at the time. And uh, then at half time, we talked about, right, it's a two-lap race. Um, you know, you've won the first, we've got to win the second, you know, and little things like that. Plus also, um, it's like it's like being at the Olympics. Um, you've got all the, the, as a sprinter, for instance, world-class sprinter, you've got all the, Run the hit. Got the better, the better games, the better run when you get the semi final. And so you've you've got to be ready for it and not take it for granted. And that's the toughest thing when you've got a favourite side. When you've got the side that is the favourite, fancy winning all those games and then get to the final and get beat. You know. Mm. Plus, obviously, New Zealand. But I had the I had the benefit of New Zealand were a great side and playing really well. They were doing doing as well as we were, and they had Williams and that in there, and they were the world champions, and we wanted that title. So, you know, it wasn't hard to, to push them along. I didn't. You don't have to motivate a side. I think you just have to inspire them. They're motivated already, Paulie. You know, I think I've told you that. People they want to play the game. Most players would play the game without money, although uh, the clubs would love to have that, but that's not going to happen. We know that, but. Um, so they love to play the sport, but um, but realistically, it's just giving them a reason that why they you know to inspire them about a particular thing in their life, like a game. And the World Cup final is a big, big thing. We we wanted that title back, um, we, and we went out and kept them to zero tries. You know, again, um, something that I didn't think would happen. To be quite honest, I thought, well, final. You know, we. And I was worried that if they got one against us, that the boys would break the boys down a bit, but they wouldn't let them score. Mm. So um, we were just, it was, it was probably the best side I've ever coached, including like in, in real terms, the quality of that side. And I had some great 
you know, with Darren Lockyer's era and a few of the, you know, Petra Cinema Sivas and all those guys too, had some great players. But I would think, I don't think I coached a better side than that 13 side, that group, yeah. In terms of it, obviously the, the Australian team have gone on and, and won again and, and carry on winning. And I just yeah. want to ask you about the, the World Cup that's just been postponed for this year. Mm. The fact that... Yeah. There was a talk at one stage of a World Cup without Australia and New Zealand, and you've mentioned there what a final it was and, and having that. Yeah. A World Cup without those two isn't a World Cup, is it? No, no. You've got to play. And, I mean, it's disappointing for England, I know, with all the work that they put in and so on. But looking at COVID in Australia at the moment, I don't think it's got worse. So, I mean, it's, it was obvious Australia, you know, were worried about that. Now they've been justified. You know, I mean, it's nothing like here in England or let alone in America, but it is a worry, right? And um, they've had a tough season, been locked up all year uh, to keep the system going over there. So, it, you know, it was never, it was never really going to be, why, why not postpone it, you know? Um, so hopefully, um, I'm not sure where, where they're up to with it, as to whether or not it's going to be in England next year, but um, I hope so. And that it's not moved around, you know, England deserved to get the shot, um, I think the crowds were brilliant in 13. You know, you know the Tongans, Samoans, uh, Fijians, Papuans, everyone played such an attractive brand of footy that you could go to any game and see some brilliant football, you know. So um, I'm hoping that um, that happens again for the, for, the, for the country and the game here for next year. Yeah. Carl, of course, you've sort of got a foot in both camps, haven't you, in wanting the World Cup to take place with, with the three games at Doncaster, but then being a Kiwi yourself, you understand the, the mechanisms of it, the, the impact that would have and not having those two in there. 100%, Robbie. You know, they are the, they are the two top, top nations when it comes to the World Cup. But you can see why, like Tim said, why it's happened. And, you know, we're all all right over here thinking we're, it's all right, we can get it on. But if you put your you know, put your, where they're standing, put your foot in their shoes. They see games over here getting called off every other week in Super League, and they're probably thinking, you know, it, it's not um, it's not safe. So at the end of the day, you know, they get one case over there and they shut the whole place down in New Zealand. So, mm -hmm. you know, probably the right call. As disappointing as it is, um, it's probably the right call because they're, they don't, they don't know what, what they're coming into and then they've got to go back and isolate and they're in the pre-season and it's, it's going to have a knock-on effect on their season. So, mm. listen, I know that John Dutton and the team, they did everything they could to try and get it on and you've got to respect that. But then on the other side, if we were over the other side of the world and we've we seen what we're seeing here, maybe we'd be thinking twice as well. So... For all, I think it's the right decision. As much as we were going to host Samoa here and have three games here, listen, we'll still do that in 12 months. We just need to – it gives us another 12 months to prepare and and hopefully more crowds come in and sell more tickets and and the occasion becomes even bigger than what we were wanting to make it this year. So mm. for me, it's it's probably the right call. And, and you said it from the start, you can't. You can't really have a World Cup without New Zealand and Australia, and and if, and if you did win it, you're not you're not really the world champions. Let's be right. <laughs> Tim, for all your accolades, playing and coaching, surely having Carl as your right hand man for the All Stars <laughs> you must be for the, the order, is it? <laughs> I give him twenty quid to say. Uh, that. He's yeah, a top notch, top notch manager, mate. Don't worry. When you look after the coach, he gets extra shirts and. <laughs> <laughs> all these sorts of things and and uh and he brings your coffee occasionally you know that's 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 great no look the staff the staff led by Carl were brilliant and uh i gotta say the reason things went well for us and it's what happens in a rep side when you're away with a you know talk about the australian side and coaching it you, you don't coach sides you manage them and and the management comes not only just from the coach but from all of the staff as well You've got to have a really focused staff, a really diligent staff that want to look after them big time. Uh, but it's not not pressure on each other. You know, you've got to be able to have a laugh and, and be be ready to play. And and then, and obviously, it was a bit difficult when we were together because of lockdown. All stars, for instance. 
but we'd set it up in such a way and the village hotel were great uh, in such a way that the guys, you know, didn't really feel that they were locked in. Um, and all of those things, everyone, everyone, as I say, with, led by Carl and his, and his and the management crew were so good that it, it made my job easy. And for the players, it was seamless to come in. Uh, you know, everything was done for them. Um, and so that just made for a, a really happy camp. And when you get a really happy camp, that's when you you know you win games. That's what it's all about. Yeah, I'll tell you what. That, I'll tell you is what. Is that good enough, Carl? Is that good enough for you? That's brilliant, mate. But I, I will. I, you know, uh, let's all be honest here. When when we were all coming in and we all got the role, got the got the job, and to um, obviously work for Tim, um, it's it was. I, I was driving over there, and I'd, I'd already met Tim a couple of times. You know, in our pre meetings and. It's a, it was an honour, um, and, it, and it was a bit daunting. You know, you're thinking, gee, you, I'm, I'm going to go and work here for the, the Australian boss. He's, he's won World Cups. And it, but absolutely, I sucked the life out of him all week. I've got a phone here. <laughs> I, th I think he thought I was ignorant and rude because every time he was talking to me, I've got my phone going and I'm, I'm writing the notes down about the three things he tells me you've got to set your principles on and, you know, uh, things like he'd say, um, win the game early, score score the points late, and I'm, because oh, I forget. So I've got, to, I'm typing it and I'm thinking, is he thinking I'm rude here or what? I'm not. <laughs> and in the end, I said, Tim, don't think I'm rude, mate. I'm just typing everything down so I can remember to take it back to Clubland with me. But it was an honor. It was a, an absolute honor. Um, wonderful fella. Just sit there and talk with you about rugby league all day and, you always get your preconceived ideas of, how, you know, oh, how's this going to go and how's he going to be? And But Tim, it was like I'd known him all my life. That, that's how he made me feel in the, in the group. And I think we were like that. And don't get me wrong, we had some real difficult days the first couple of days. The players mm. didn't have a clue what was going on. The players that's were right. loving it. Yeah, yeah. Me and Tim were, were trying to do what we could do to, to fix it up. And I'm sitting there thinking, mate, I've got... I've got the Aussie coach here and we we haven't even got a team yet. You know what I mean? And mm. Tim would say, right, I'll give him a ring. You ring him and uh, see if you can give him a ring and get him. And one at Tim, it was a, a, yeah. it all added yeah. to it. And we, we, we just made this feel good factor. We knew deep down we we're going to be a chance here. And England didn't think we were going to beat them. I'll be, let's be right. Mm. 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 Yeah, well, technically, we shouldn't have been able to, given the problems we had. And by the way, I'll give you that thirty quid back for all that, all those wraps, Carl. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it, it, it's managing. It's 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 how you put together a squad. And I suppose the experience I'd had with the Australian boys, and you'd think it'd be seamless there too, but they, they, we had management problems and issues and injuries and and bickering and a few a few uh, problems out of camp, you know, which every team. Uh, seem to have in 13, you know, uh, so we, we had our issues, but it's just managing it and uh, getting through it, uh, being strong, but but also understanding issues, you know, that that can't happen. So we've got to move on and do something else, you know. Mm. Um, you can't sit back and sook about it. Um, so um, we only had those couple of days to prepare, Carl, didn't we? So, you know, we had to prepare on the field, let alone... Uh, try and instill the camaraderie that it needs to be when you bring a group of guys who bash, who bash each other week in and week out to come together and play together. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that was the secret to it. And I think, Tim, you know, we, we made it clear that um, if we want this to continue, um, we had to take it a bit serious and we, True. we, yeah. we sort of put a, a, some meaning to it with, uh, with Mossy um, and that was a fantastic night. I think all the boys will never forget that night mm. when Mossy came yeah, with the kids. Right. And we, you know, we we had an obligation here to try and continue that fixture. And listen, mm. I don't, I'm not bothered what anyone says. I think we've done our job to hopefully build on mm. that and, and yeah. keep this All Stars England thing going because we are trying to prepare them to have some tough games before they go into battle with the Kiwis. Right. That's right. I thought the heritage numbers were great too, Holly. Um, so they're bought in on it now. Those players have a, like you do at club level, in most clubs they have a heritage number for their, the Australians have it for their players um, uh, at club level, let alone um, at Australian level. And, you know, you've got a number that when you play, so you become part of the history of 
of it. And I think that was a, that was good to resurrect that too, mate. Um, yeah. In fact, I don't think it was even resurrected. I, de- I don't think it ever happened. So all those players who played, you know, 100 and what was it, 180 odd players who had played didn't have numbers, but then they have now, you know. So their families and relatives all have the number. So that's, uh, I thought that was great. I think, you know, the guys took some pride in that. It was well organised, yeah. Right. So, and, and at the end of the day, Robbie, uh, we've still got the cup, mate. We've got the cup for, we'll hold that tight with us for a, another year anyway. But, and we haven't taken our shirts off either since yeah. then, have we, Carl? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Tim, uh, uh, we're, we're still, rubbing it in. We're rubbing it in, aren't we? We're rubbing it in. Yeah. yeah. We're still, um, obviously, we're still lucky to have you over here. Um, this is mm. why you're on here doing this podcast with us because. Uh, the next move for Mr. Tim Sheens, he's back to Aussie, but um, he's been to the airport to get on his flight to, and he got turned away. Do you want to tell everyone what's happening with you now, what, what, where you're on to? Uh, mate, it's it's late October, as I've booked again, but um, talking to family and friends today in Sydney, they're, um, they're getting more cases, so it's getting tougher and tougher. That's why the, the game's been played in Brisbane, in Queensland. So it they're saying now September may be locked down, so I'm getting a bit nervous. So I went, I pushed it right out to the back end of October, hoping that that'd be enough. You know, things would settle down over there. Mm-hmm. So it's not, um, it's not our fault here. I've got both vaccinations and and so on. But over there, um, it's getting in. They cut the numbers going into the country, and that of course means the airlines haven't got enough flights in to make it worthwhile. So places like Eddie had and. Various other flights, some American Airlines and so on, just shut down. Qantas aren't flying. Um, so it's difficult to get a flight. Um, then, of course, you've got to quarantine when you get there too, um, which is costly as well. You have to pay that cost again on top of your ticket. So it's pretty savage. But uh, so I'm not sure, mate. I'm just waiting. Meantime, I'm dealing with the club through Zoom, just like, us, just like we're doing here. I've got a meeting with the board tonight, so... So I am working from 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 Zoom, which is the the nature of things in the world today, isn't it? Just what I'm saying, Tim, is just just tell everyone. Uh, obviously, I knew you were you you plan to settle here in the UK, but I'm not sure if everyone's aware of of where you're going and what you're doing next. Oh, uh, right. Role, well, I'm there for role. two years. This year, the rest of this year, and two uh, in management, uh, not coaching. And then, uh, although I'm working with pathways with the kids and uh, and general manage- management issues, um, there is a sounding board for the coaching staff if they want. But I'm not uh, I'm not general manager or anything. It's more a ambassador slash, uh, you know, almost, um, you know, yeah, pretty much an ambassador role. You know, to all departments, you know, marketing, uh, football, um, media, anything. You know, I'm there to try and lift the profile of the club and support them. And um, and then on back to England, mate. Uh, we're um, uh, I'm only a few months away from getting citizenship, and my wife's the same. So we'll we'll be back to settle here. That's the plan. That's at, that's didn't... at West Tigers, yeah, Tim. Yeah, yeah, West Tigers. After that, um, two years. If it extends, we'll wait and see. But if it doesn't, um, uh, we'll be back. We're coming back to England anyway. I intend to settle back here. So. I'll be pestering you to get my ball machine back, Carl. And, uh, <laughs> hey, and and don't forget what I've told you. We um, when I need some fellas on loan, I'm coming to ask you to send a couple over on loan to Donny. Well, not a problem, mate. The, the, as as long as they can get in, the biggest problem is obviously getting kids in from Australia, isn't it? You know, if they haven't played first grade uh, or they've not competed at uh, international level, and of course the the uh, World Cup being uh, being cancelled will take a lot of them out because I remember in 13, if you'd played a certain number of tests, you're allowed to get into the country and a lot of boys got into the country on that. Mm. So uh, that'll probably limit the numbers coming in because it's you've got to play NRL first grade or at least uh, a certain number of tests to get into the country. So it's a bit of an issue. But anyway, um, uh, I'll do what I can for you, mate. <laughs> 